Emus, storks, cranes and bustards are some of the biggest birds found in Australia. Today we will look at the cranes. There are two cranes, the Brolga and the Sarus crane. Cranes can be found throughout Europe, Asia, Australia and North America. The Brolga is the first crane that we will look at. Here is an adult and a juvenile in freshwater close to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Brolgas are more common to the north of Australia, but they do come down on the east coast as far as Melbourne, but mostly west of the Divide. Surprisingly, the first bird to be described in 1810 was seen at Botany Bay in Sydney. In flight, the Brolgas are a special sight. Like raptors and pelicans, they look for thermals to get elevation. At high altitudes, they search for suitable habitat, wetland, with adjacent grass area. But landing and takeoff, like many other large birds, lacks the finesse of their high altitude gliding. Here a group of brolgas in flight notice the lead bird is pulled down by a peck at the feet by the second bird. Here again in slow motion. This bird is smaller, probably a juvenile, and is being taught a lesson that it cannot lead at this stage. The juvenile drops to a lower altitude, then follows on. Cranes are waders, and all cranes have a non-feathered area, usually around the head. And so it is with a brolga. The majority of cranes of the world have non-feathered areas over the face. But with the Australian cranes, the non-feathered area extends beyond the face to behind the head. Around the edge of the wetland, where the soil is soft and sedges grow, they will there probe for the tubers. They will also feed on dry grass areas. With their bill they shift the dirt, digging down to the roots. The diet is mostly vegetarian, but they are omnivorous and feed opportunistically, taking insects, amphibians and small reptiles. The red pigmentation of the Brolga and the Cyrus crane is on the non-feathered area. Often this is called bare skin, but don't think of it as smooth skin, for it is very papillomatous. The pigment is contained within these papillomas of the skin. John Gould called the Brolga the native's friend. Recently, when going through Mataranka in the Northern Territory, there were two Brolgas in the park where indigenous people had picnics. I asked one of the locals whether the birds came there often. He replied, they live here, he's just one of us. John Gould also reported a similar experience when he visited Camden in the company of James MacArthur, who had a pair of domesticated Brolgas in his kiss garden. Earlier on, I showed a juvenile brolga in the water. Here is another. It's a little hard to see between the parents. Note the red band is still grey. In brolgas, in contrast to other cranes, there is a gular fold on the top part of the neck. And the size of this gular fold helps to tell you that this bird is a juvenile, for it is not yet developed. All cranes have mating vocalisations, and the brolga is no exception to the rule. Its voice is one of the lowest pitched of all the cranes. Anatomical studies have shown that the trachea is in close proximity to the breastbone, and the breastbone serves to give resonance to this call. Cranes throughout the world have a ritual dance. This is either for mating or for partner acknowledgement. The brolga also has a dance. In many cultures throughout the world, this ritual dance of the bird has been taken into culture. In China, for instance, the crane there has been used to stylize movements in Kung Fu. In Australia, it has been incorporated into indigenous dance. Brolgas bond for life, and when they begin to call like this, it is the beginning of their dance. Listen, the female gives a single call and sometimes, not always, but the male will then give a double call. It's also said that the male will often open his wings a lot more than the female, and he is a larger bird.
Visually, it's hard to tell a male and a female brolga. Size gives the only clue. And on the left, the bird is larger. This is the male. Here is another pair of brolgas in South Australia. Notice one picks up some grass, then a stick, and throws it. This is a suggestion to the partner that nesting time is here. Not that they build a nest, but simply lay the eggs on the ground, surrounded by a few leaves from the wetland area. More mating antics of the brolgas, this time in South Australia, where unfortunately brolga numbers have reduced. This marsh area is in the middle of a desert at Coward Springs. The marsh is supplied by water fed from an artesian bore. Most of the wing flapping in this occasion seems to be done by the bird on the right. A larger bird, so I presume that this is the male. And it is picking up sticks, suggesting perhaps that the female should lay her eggs. But this may just as well be part of the dance routine. Brolga taxonomy. It has moved around like the sands in the estuary. When first described in 1810, it was given the name Ardia rubicunda. Now Ardia is the genus name for the heron group. Herons fly with their neck pulled in. But the Brolga flies like a stork with its neck and legs extended. Latham referred to it as the Indian crane, for Latham had seen the drawings and paintings of Watling. Watling was an early convict. So Latham thought that it was a Indian crane or a Saris crane. In the mid 1800s, John Gould gave it the name Grus Australasianus, Grus being Latin for crane. At the same time, Leichhardt was exploring Australia and in his journal, he called it Ardia Antigone. Then in 1910, John Matthews, in his book of Australian birds, called it Antigone rubicunda. Antigone is from the Greek meaning against birth, the same term used for the child of Oedipus. Today, worldwide, there are two names for the genus. One is Grus, the other Antigone. Then in 2010, using mitochondrial DNA, a crane phylogeny was compiled at the University of Illinois. This genetic study showed a Pacific Rim effect and the cranes that were thought to be monophyletic are indeed polyphonetic. So the term Antigone was resurrected as the new genus name, and four cranes belong to this, including the Brolga and Sarus. So I suspect the final name of this bird will be Antigone rubicundus, ruby for red, cundus for example. Well at this point we will leave the brolgas dancing and look at another feature that is typical of brolgas flocking. Look at this, here we have a thousand birds at Clermont, 43 degrees, no water, the video is distorted with the heat. They gather in an old sorghum patch. The reason for flocking is uncertain. The wet season was over, so they're not going into breeding mode but coming out of it. Possibly it's for the juveniles to get introduced as when they do mate, it's a mate for life. This marsh grass area in the Queensland Channel Country is a more typical habitat for brolgas. The soil is a little bit damp, soft, so they can easily dig into the ground, finding the tubers. A delicacy for the brolga is a lotus seed pod. And as you can see, here the brolga has found an old pod and he's hoping that there is still some tasty seed contained within. The reason why a brolga is not an egret is that in flight it flies with its neck extended, whereas an egret has it pulled back. So the brolga is an Australian crane, but I should mention it is also in the southern latitudes of New Guinea. The main time that brolgas call is when they take off, when they land, in flight, and then they have a territorial call, letting other birds know where they are. This is more pronounced 
when they are in breeding mode with young. Look at this group of brolgas closely. Yes, there are brolgas, four of them on the left, but then the two birds on the right have red coming down on the neck. This is the Sarus crane. Here, another solitary Sarus crane. A brolga walks in front and then another Sarus crane. These two cranes share the same habitat and are similar in dietary requirements and behaviour. The Sarus crane is only found in northern Australia, it does not go south. Then the other place it is found is in northern India, and between India and Australia it is occasionally found in southeast Asia. Here are two Sarus cranes, the male again being the bigger, the female a little bit smaller. Here is a juvenile Sarus crane, notice that even in the young you can see the reddening of the upper neck. The younger birds are totally dependent on the adult for feeding and they watch as the adult digs in the mud. Once food is found, the adult drops it where the hungry youngster is waiting. Like Brogwas, the Sarus crane has times when it calls. In this case, there are two adults with two juveniles. A little further down the lagoon, further Sarus cranes are landing and they are calling, telling them that this is their territory as they are caring for their young. Like the Brolga, the Sarus crane generally lays two eggs, and here you can see the two young birds, a little older, not requiring feeding by the parent. These birds are foraging for themselves, but as yet have not learned to put their head under water. It's interesting that sometimes the Brolga and the Sarus crane can submerge their head for several minutes, digging for tubers under the water. Twin Sarus cranes. One is bigger than the other. One is male, the other female. To conclude, here are the frequency sonograms of both the Sarus and the Brolga. As you can see, the Brolga has a very low pitched call, the lowest pitch of all the cranes. On behalf of the Plumes of Oz, thank you for watching this video and I hope you have enjoyed it. If you would like to watch further release of Australian bird videos, please subscribe.